talk about the support for the BPF architecture in the CNU toolchain. That is for the introduction. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to talk about a project that we started in Oracle like uh, half a year ago. And uh, the result of that project is, well, is the support of this new architecture in the, in the CNU toolchain. So first I will go very briefly over eBPF, you know, in the sense of what it is and how it looks like. Um, then I will show a few um, gimbals of, uh, of the implementation itself. We shall see that eBPF, even though it looks like a harmless, simple, little architecture, the devil is in the detail. And there, are some, there is some fun hidden there, you know, when it comes to actually implement it. Um, then I will talk a bit more about that in the compiling BPF section. And then, well, core current state, uh, future plans, blah, 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 blah. So the project itself, again, this is something that we do uh, in Oracle. Um, we have three different phases or goals for this project. The first number one was basically to add a target to GCC, Binutils, and the other components for BPF. Um, the second one is to actually make the programs that GCC generates, you know, like uh, compliant to the kernel. We shall see that one thing is to generate BPF, and something completely different is to generate a BPF that will actually run in the kernel. Um, we are still, we are just starting the second phase <laughs> because right now the code that GCC generates, uh, mm, well, let's say that is not that ready for the kernel verifier. And then the third phase is to provide other development goodies, you know, or tools for the eBPF uh, developers, uh, like simulators, like uh, debuggers, like, you know, name it, a proper tool chain, right? Which, by the way, is something that is sort of new in the BPF world because BPF is very kernel, mm, is very, is very kernel. So <laughs> let's say that uh, um, they have a tendency to fix everything in kernel and uh, we really think that uh, approaching the domain from a tooling perspective probably will help it, you know, it will help them. Not all of them agree about this. So first, BPF. This is a bit confusing. It is for me too. Um, originally, there was something called CBPF, which is now the C stands for Classic BPF. What is this? Which, by the way, it's extremely old. You know, I mean, this has been lingering in the kernel like for since a long time. Um, basically, one of the components in the kernel is a packet filter. What is it? Well, you have a socket packets go, you know, travel through that socket. And then um, a long time ago, they added some functionality so you could somehow specify certain conditions in the structure or the contents of the packets so you could filter them, block them, count them, you know, what is like packet filtering. Um, this description of which packets to hold, which packets to count, uh, it was, you know, they were called like BPF programs because basically they would give you, you know, a sort of a little bytecode so you could specify little programs that would uh, determine whether a packet was selected or filtered or not. This was very, very simple and very limited, you know, like by design. Um, but in the recent years, well, the people have been expanding into this um, Berkeley packet filter and they have been making it more sophisticated. Um, meaning that uh, um, and right now you can, uh, the set of programs that you can run in this, in this kernel virtual machine are no longer only a small trivial, you know, programs for filtering packets. Um, currently you can do much more complex things than that. Um, so this is a virtual machine in the kernel. It is remotely similar to, to Inferno and Limbo, right? Where, if you remember Inferno, in Inferno you had like a, a, the possibility of running bytecodes in the kernel in privileged mode, 
and those programs you will write in them in a programming language called Limbo. And then Limbo also was a kernel verifier, basically, that will inspect your program and it will determine if it was safe to execute your program in the kernel context or not. Well, the eBPF, it actually works like that. Um, regarding the name CBPF, eBPF, so you will have classic BPF, then it, now it is extended BPF, and uh, the last news as of the last couple of weeks is that now we should call it just BPF. Which, uh, okay, I mean, but it's good to, to, to settle on something, right? We want to communicate. Anyway, how does BPF look like as a instruction set or architecture? Well, um, apparently, at first sight, it's a very um, conventional, harmless instruction set. Basically, the instructions are 64 bits. Um, there is one instruction which is 128 bits, whose purpose, yeah, you can imagine, is to load 64-bit constants, you know, into, into one of the registers. Um, you have 10 general purpose registers, which are also 64 bits. And then you have, and here it, it starts the fun here, you know, the weirdness, you have one read-only frame pointer register, and you don't have a stack pointer. Um, there is no floating point support, because it is the kernel. The kernel people will say, this is the kernel, go somewhere else, you know, with your floating point. And um, it is designed, the instruction set, to be just in time compiled very efficiently to the different native architectures which are supported in the kernel. And we shall see later that this had an impact into the design of the BPF instruction set itself. Meaning what? Meaning that at least the intention is that for every single BPF instruction, there should be one equivalent instruction in every platform supported by the kernel. Yeah, I know. Um, I don't think anyone is doing any serious BPF development now in anything else than an x86. But this is going to change probably soon, and then we shall see how much more this design goal can be kept. But in principle, it is like that. This is to ease, you know, the amount of work and non-trivial work that the, the, the compilers in kernel do, because it is kernel mode and you don't want to do, you don't want to put a, a complicated compiler in the kernel, because it may be buggy. And uh, the instruction set, in principle, is orthogonal to NDNS. Why? Because the kernel run in different machines, which can be little or big endian. And then, at least initially, the, 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 the idea was to make the instruction set orthogonal to it, meaning that the instructions look the same in big and little endian, but then the contents, it is the contents of the different fields in the instruction which are encoded depending on whether you're running. We shall see that there is a little problem with this. And of course, the instruction set is very limited. So the registers, I already mentioned them, easy. The instruction formats, if you are curious, now you will see here why I'm listing uh, two different 64-bit variants, uh, two different variants of the instructions. It is because of the NDNS, but we will look at it later. And this is the instruction set. Um, well, the first, call, the first uh, row, you know, is like the class of the instructions. Um, but you, should, you can see there is, okay, addition, subtraction, arithmetic, um, for every arithmetic and logical instruction, you have a 32-bit variant, which basically uh, works in the 32, in the least 32, in the least significant 32 bits of the of the registers. Then you have load and store instructions, some of which are generic, some of which are specific to storing and loading data from and to socket buffers in the kernel. Those ones are getting obsolete anyway. You know, I mean, new BPF programs, they should be using always the generic uh, load and install instructions. You have jumps, conditional jumps, unconditional jump. Um, then you call, have a call instruction. You have an exit instruction, which is actually used to finish your BPF program and also to return from a, from a function. Um, and then you have a couple of instructions to, to handle NDNS. Easy, right? 
So that was the registers and instruction set. What about the ABI? Well, there is none for the moment. <laughs> or, or actually there is, but uh, both at the same time. Why I'm saying this? Because um, the, the current LLVM backend generates L files. There are also a bunch of other BPF compilers out there which also generate L files. And now in GCC, we are generating L files with BPF programs inside. So what constitutes a valid eBPF program in an L file? Well, it's not documented. So basically, um, at, as of today, in practice, it is what LLVM produces and what the different kernel loaders are happy with. There are two main kernel loaders. There is something called bpfload.c, which is actually a sample program in the kernel. And also there is this, this BPF leaf, or leaf BPF, I don't ever remember what, what is the right name, which basically is the canonical implementation of all these sort of things. Um, well, um, this worked up to now because the same people who are doing the kernel bits of, of BPF are the people who are actually working in the LLVM port. So I understand that this works for them. But now that we are adding a new player in the game, to the game, well, um, we need uh, to start, you know, thinking about having, uh, let's say, you know, a documented ABI, which is participated by all the companies and all the, the, the compilers, you know, LLVM, GCC, those other little compilers, and the kernel. Hmm? Um, and well, in the plumbers last week, uh, I told to the, about this to the to the kernel hackers there, and they agreed to this. So most probably we will we will start documenting the ABI at some point. I hope. So this was us for BPF. Any question about this? About it? Instruction set ABI, little thing. Okay. Now the port itself. Um, well, the first thing was the name, the triplet. So then I decided to go with BPF unknown none. Um, why? Well, the CPU is clear, BPF, which is, which is a, a virtual CPU, virtual architecture, the vendor unknown, uh, and then the operating system none. Why? Because BPF, even though it is implemented as, as, as such in the Linux kernel, it is bare metal, right? I mean, there is no operating system. Um, we shall see, we have problems with new lib, you know, and also with the libc, but I will mention that later. Uh, and thanks to the, to the config guest script, you can use BPF none or just BPF and it will work. The next step was the, was the ELF support. Um, I was lucky and the, the EM BPF number, the BP, there, were a, there was an ELF number for BPF already which was used, used by LLVM, so I did not have to do anything. But then I did, to, I did have to add relocations, right, to elf.h. Those are the relocations. Then next it came the BFD support. So basically I went easy and simple, and I am supporting a BFD architecture, B, BPF, a BFD machine, only one, BPF, and 64-bit uh, self-support in both Big Endian and Little Endian. Also very simple. And uh, for the port itself, I decided to use uh, CGEN, uh, which was an interesting experience. And uh, I, am, I have to say that I'm very happy with my decision. Even though I had to, I had to pacify CGEN with the fact of having 64-bit instructions. And um, I have to say that there is some work to be done there because this theoretical support that CGEN has for having instruction words, fields, you know, out of the, of the basic word of the instruction, it doesn't work that well in practice. But anyway, I'm happy about the decision. So basically, well, I define an architecture and typical CGEN stuff, like the hardware, the instruction set, fields, operands, then the instructions themselves. And then, um, generated by CGEN or from CGEN plus some glue code. Well, there is an assembler, uh, PPF unknown non yes, a gas port. The gas ports get to arguments to, so you can generate big Endian or little Endian. 
Um, note that the same target supports, uh, I mean, it is BNDian in that sense. So with the same uh, cross-compiler or cross-assembler, for example, you can generate both little Indian or big Indian uh, BPF code, which I think it is handy. And, uh, well, also the disassembler, which is generated almost all of it from the CGEN description. And that is how it looks like, um, the BPF assembler. The linker. Um, BPF is weird. I mean, if we understand what the kernel loads, what you can give to the kernel, so it can plug it in the kernel, it can plug it in, in itself and execute, it doesn't really follow what ELF was designed to do. Because, for example, an ELF executable is supposed to have one entry point, right? And um, and to be an executable, basically. Um, what the kernel people are doing is that in, for a BPF program, you generate an object file in which you have different sections. The sections, you name them, you encode in the name of the section uh, information that the kernel uses to create internally several BPF programs in the kernel and hook them in the proper places. So let's say, for example, that you want to write a BPF program that executes every time, I don't know, a probe in a probe, for example, in a K probe in the kernel. Then you will put, you will compile a, a C function and you will put it in an ELF section called uh, probe slash um, whatever address slash, you know. I mean, you encode, I don't remember the exact syntax, but basically in the name, in the ELF section names, you are encoding the semantics or where you want the kernel to install that BPF program. Um, so they are not using linkers, <laughs> you know, I mean, but they wanted to have some linking support. Why? Because I really believe that BPF as such, it should move forward more, you know, into, I mean, the more conventionally we can support it, the better. That's my opinion. That's my, and uh, for example, I thought, well, why not? Why can't I build a little BPF program in one dot, 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 dot O and another one in another object file and link them together? So I added support in the linker too. Um, it is preliminary because it is really not clear, you know, how to consult, you know, the requirements of BPF in ELF, but we shall see. And the rest of the binary utilities, I don't know, a name, object, copy, I mean, all of them. Um, we have a GDB port that we have not uh, submitted yet because uh, we are also working on the simulator. And without the simulator, submitting the GDB port is basically pointless. So that's why we are waiting. Um, um, we have a problem with BPF and debugging which is that we shall see in, in five minutes that uh, because of restrictions, um, you cannot access, you cannot backtrace, you cannot backtrack, sorry, you cannot backtrack. I mean, at the moment it's technically not possible to backtrack. And when I was writing the GCC backend, of course, at first I was like, okay, yeah, of course I want, I want ORF2. But then I was uh, writing the bpf.h file in the GCC backend, and then when it came to define the CFA, <laughs> I was like, mm, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> I was like, okay, there should be, where, where it, what will be the, call, the, 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 the CFA for BPF? And then that is when I realized that no chance. So then um, I don't think it is that, I mean, does it make sense to support DORF2 or is it even possible to support DORF2 without a CFA? No, I mean, that's uh, because then I basically, I turned to stabs, which probably made very people unhappy, including myself, because I think that there is people who actually want to deprecate the support for stabs in, the, in GCC. 
And, uh, but I don't know. Then I think it was Jeff who mentioned in the mailing list that uh, there are some ports using still Dorf 1, and apparently Dorf, the older version of Dorf is not that dependent on having CFA. I don't know. This is something I have to, I have to explore a bit more. Um, but anyway, then there is the simulator. Um, my goal is basically to be able to um, simulate the context that the a BPF program would see in the kernel. Why? Because um, at the moment, if you are writing BPF programs now, um, for example, the only way to see what your program will do is to actually run it in the kernel. The only way to know if your program is accepted by the validator is to actually syscall it in the kernel and say and see you know what the, the verifier says about it, if it rejects it or not. Of course, I think you get a yes or a no. You, I don't think you get any kind of detail about why the program is being rejected. Or maybe yes in some trace, eh, but I don't know, in some log. But um, So I think that from a tooling perspective, I think it is important for us to provide, you know, uh, means so the BPF developers can know as soon as possible if the program they are writing uh, is valid or not, without actually having to syscall the program in the kernel and see what happens. But this will require uh, some work. Actually, there is also a CGEN problem there because basically the the, the, code, the simulator code that CGEN generates, the decoder, is completely broken for, um, for you know, the complete specification for fields. Instead of the it assumes that all the ports use the abbreviated form somehow. I have a patch for that, but I am not sure if it fixes the problem properly or not. It fixes my problem, but I don't know. We shall see. Um, and then there is the GCC backend that, uh, that well, um, it works. It generates code. And, well, yeah. It is at least as powerful as the, as the clunky LLVM backend. But I say that that way because my boss told me that I have to be polite when I speak in public. Let's say that it could be that it's better. So, um, um, the backend, the UCC backend, has some BPF specific options. Uh, there is a minus M kernel, which is, it will be the equivalent to a minus M CPU in other architectures. Um, I was very happy and very proud of, of this option, but I was in the Polambers the last days and basically they told me that it is useless. Uh, so, okay. Okay, I don't know. Maybe I will remove it, maybe I will keep it, but it, it defaults to the latest anyway. You know, well, the reason they told me that is that apparently, and okay, now that I think about it, I have to agree, um, it's all because of the back ports, basically, right, in the distros and whatnot. I mean, this will work w well in an ideal world, but we live in a dirty world of back ports and, you know, well, you know about it. So, basically, I don't know. I like the option, but that's because I don't use BPF, I suspect that. Um, there is... Then, well, there is a minus M big endian, M little endian, which does the obvious thing. And then there is this option, which is minus M frame size, which is basically to increase the upper limit of, uh, of, of, of the stack in BPF programs. With, we shall see that it is by default in the kernel, currently is limited to 512 bytes. Yes, bytes. Um, then I added in the back in the backend supports also some target specific built-ins. Um, one of the things that the BPF programs do is that they can call what is called help kernel helpers. What is a kernel helper? Well, it's like a function call. Um, it's like it's sort of a syscall that the BPF kernel in the kernel can do, right? To access to services provided by C functions, normal C functions in the kernel. Uh, there is a lot of kernel helpers. Why? Because the BPF programs are so limited, we shall see that, for example, it, it, the verifier will not allow you to execute an unbounded loop, for example, in a BPF program, because that would be too dangerous. So every time that a BPF program needs either to read memory or write to memory 
or doing something that programmatically will exceed the limitations of BPF, then it calls to a kernel helper. For example, there is a kernel helper for reading from user memory. But also there is a kernel helper to transform uh, an integer into a string. Why? Because that, that will require unbounded loops and you cannot execute unbounded loops in, the, in BPF code. So that is what the kernel helpers are for. Then when I, when I wrote the backend, this is another of ideas that I was very happy with, which is, hey, I'm going to provide built-ins. The LLVM people, instead, they use a trick and actually, uh, which doesn't work very well, it's very fragile. So I said, okay, I want to do it properly. So then I created more than 100 built-ins, <laughs> like the ones that you see in this slide, like built-in BPF helper, map lookup, LM, blah, blah, blah. Um, in the plumbers a few days ago, they also told me that uh, that's too rigid in practice. Why? Because they should be able to, uh, to use future, you know, super new helpers, you know, without having to patch the compiler. And then it was like, okay, you are right. Um, and then there are uh, uh, three built-ins for non-generic loads, which are for generating a specific BPF instructions, which are not generic. And this is new. I basically did that yesterday in the flight from, from the plumbers because I was feeling so guilty about it. So basically, I am replacing, I have not committed this yet, but I am replacing those built-ins helpers with one uh, function declaration attribute, which basically you can use it to mark uh, a function prototype as a kernel helper and the number of the kernel helper. It is more flexible than the built-ins, and it is still robust, right? Um, so, well, I, I think, I hope this is a better solution. I don't know. Um, this has a very good side effect, which is that I can make the backend uh, oblivious of the specific helpers. So a, a, a fat table, I had to put it in, you know, I, now I can remove it, and I am very happy about it. So, there is also this bpf-helpers.h file, which basically, um, in the kernel source, there is a bpf-helpers.h file, which is supposed to be used by every BPF program. And it gives you, you know, like, generic good stuff. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, it is LVM-specific. So then, what I did was to distribute with GCC a bpf-helpers.h, which is supposed to give you the same interface. And then, of course, what we really want is to get rid of it as soon as we can. So as soon as we can make the BPF helpers.h file in the kernel to work with both LLVM and GCC, which I hope it will happen soon, then I will remove this uh, file from the compiler. Um, it's not completely broken. This is, you know, I mean, there are some tests that pass. Of course, those, are only te the, 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 those tests are only compilation tests because at the moment we don't have a simulator. So we cannot run, you know, the complete GCC um, test suite yet. Anyway, let's go to the fun stuff, but quickly. Compiling BPF, it is peculiar. First, first I mentioned the NDNS. Uh, so, in theory, the, the, the instruction set is supposed to be orthogonal to NDNS. But then I found out why, why, why writing my, my CGEN file, I realized that actually is not the case. Why not? Then I went to the kernel sources and then found this. This is a, a C struct, which is basically the definition in the kernel of a BPF instruction. As you can see, you can see the fields there, right? An opcode, which is a byte. Then you have a, a field for a destination register, source register, offset for the 16 bits uh, offset fields, and 32 bits immediate. Do you see something strange there? Regardless, regarding NDNS? Uh, I don't, and that's so strange. <laughs> yeah, that, exactly. You are not seeing something. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. Well, basically, um, the bit fields. There are bit fields which are smaller than one, one byte. And basically, uh, the compiler is free to reorder that. 
Um, other struct, similar structs in the kernel, if you look at the kernel headers, they use stuff like this to avoid this problem, right? So if you are in Bikendian, then you, so you can make sure that the fields are ordered in the same way. Well, for, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, the BPF instruction struct is missing that. So the effect that this has is unlimited pain, pain for me and probably not pain for the kernel hackers because they are using this struct, right? So for them it is transparent, but for the rest of the world it's not. So this is the reason why um, I have to use to do things like this in CGen. So basically, and this is explained in the CGen file in comments, um, I, had, I am defining in reality like two instruction sets instead of one. One for little Indian and one for big, big Indian. And it, in each variant, the fields are different. Well, it was here when I was very happy to use CGen because CGen has a, a superb support for macros. So then you can write, you know, this mess in a same, relatively same way. Anyway, this was one. Uh, of course, this has impacts in all parts of the tooling, in the simulator too. You know, you should be careful to swap those fields. And also, when it comes to relocation in the linker, because there are relocations which are impacting those fields too. So you have to do so. Okay. Next particularity. Um, Usually, in normal hardware architectures, you have like a, a stack pointer, which is usually mandated by the hardware, and then you maybe use a frame pointer, maybe you not, maybe the architecture gives you one, maybe you have to use your own. But at the end of the day, the function prolog and epilog looks like this, right? You update your, frame, your stack pointer, then you, sa you save your previous frame pointer, you operate, and then you restore, and you are done. But in BPF, there is no stack pointer. Um, you will say, well, what? I mean, then how are you supposed to be tracking where your stack ends? Well, you don't, because you get, you know, like automatic uh, stack allocation by the hardware, which if you think about it, is super cool, but it's weird. And, uh, um, uh, okay, this is, so how does this work? Basically, when you run your BPF program in the kernel, the kernel verifier uh, looks at the code, identifies the functions. Then for each function, I'm talking about compiled code, eh? then for each function, the verifier tracks how the stack is accessed. And then from that, the verifier basically knows exactly what is the size of the used uh, uh, frame, basically. If the verifier can't determine the size, it gives you an error, basically, and you cannot run the program. So this means that when the kernel, so let's think in BPF like if it was hardware, okay? So when the BPF processor, basically, calls your function, you are given a read-only frame pointer, and then uh, above that frame pointer, it is automatically allocated the stack there's a space that your program will need when it comes to execute execution. It's nice, no? Um, yeah, when it comes, but then the problem is ECC. Well, the problem, because of course, um, uh, first I was like, okay, usually all the ports, you know, they eliminate the argument pointer and the frame pointer to the stack pointer. But then actually what they need to do is to limit the, eliminate the stack pointer to the frame pointer which actually worked until uh, I introduced Aloka and VLAs, and then the LRA go gets into an infinite recursion because it assumes that you cannot eliminate into the stack pointer. Sorry, the other way around. You cannot eliminate the stack pointer out. Anyway, uh, it's peculiar. So what did I do to, to support Aloka and, and VLAs? Uh, I am using, you know, uh, I choose, you know, one of the registers to be a, to act as a pseudo stack pointer. Interesting enough, I don't have to restore it when I leave the function. Be why? Because when in your function you are given a read-only frame pointer, 
but everything is automatic, let's say. So you don't have to, you don't have to restore the frame pointer or the stack pointer for your caller. Co you, don't, you don't need to. Actually, the stack is disjoint because the stack is disjoint. Every time the kernel, this is from the kernel interpreter. In the kernel, you have two implementations of BPF, an interpreter and also the, the JIT. But to see the semantics, you have to read the interpreter. And you can see here that every time a function is called, um, a fresh stack frame is allocated. And uh, what, you, what you get as the frame pointer is the start of the C array, basically. Mm. So the stack is literally disjoint, yes. So you may think, OK, um, how can Akali access the stack frame of the caller? Well, actually, the verifier has a hack that allows you to do that, which is very fortunate because it allows you to pass arguments by reference. However, you cannot access the stack frame of the caller using the frame pointer that is passed to you. I mean, you can access, you can get as an argument an address into the stack of your caller, and then you access it directly. But you cannot uh, access the frame, the, the stack of the caller as relative to the, to the frame pointer, to your frame pointer. And basically, this makes it impossible to pass more than five words of arguments to a BPF function. Because the only way to pass arguments is in registers, basically. And you have five of them. Also, there is the stack uh, size limit, which until two days ago, I thought that the limitation was only per frame of function. But then I was delighted to learn two days ago that it's actually for the full program, which is even worse. And uh, um, well, what can I say? Um, by default, the kernel limits this uh, to 512 bytes. And, but I added to GCC an option, that frame size, that you can use to, to increase it up to 64K. And the reason for the 64K limit is because if, if it was bigger than that, then it will be a mess with the, with the, with, with the addressing modes, mm. which, by the way, is going to be problematic in the future, too. Okay, fast. Uh, more random stuff, sign division. BPF doesn't provide uh, an instruction for that, period. So when you find a program like this, at the moment, the LVM gives you a, an error message like this, an IC, and GCC generates a phone call, which basically is it as useless, but much more elegant, in my opinion. In BPF, there is no zero register. Um, it has an impact in addressing, of course, um, because the BPF only supports one addressing mode, which is register plus constant immediate. It doesn't support any other. So not having a zero register and only supporting register plus immediate, uh, it's problematic. I don't know how this is going to be fixed in the future. I don't think they will add a zero register, but maybe they will add, I don't know, absolute addressing or something. I don't know. We shall see. And uh, there are other limitations. Like, for example, there are no in indirect calls. No way, no how. Um, there are no indirect jumps, which also, mm, <laughs> because there are no ind indirect jumps, and the jump offset field, the offset field in the instructions, is, in, is 16 bits, signed 16 bits, um, for, in, and the unit is 64 bit words minus one. The minus one is also where, uh, weirdness of BPF. Um, so basically, the range where you can jump is very limited. But you only have in, you only have direct jumps. You don't have indirect jumps. So I was actually considering in the GC, there is one GCC test that is made with macros that it makes gotos you know in a huge function, and it fails with BPF because the only way I can think about overcoming this limitation is that if I have to jump 
you know, like from here to here, to insert, you know, like a, like a, like a stops in the way, you know. But I don't think I looked at the other ports, but I don't think that there is any port doing something like that. So I would prefer to not be the first one. Okay, we'll take a look. And there is no memory model. But from Plumbers this week, they, we were assured that it's coming, which is very important to have because then we can have like an instruction scheduler, you know, and uh, at the moment there is no memory model. Memory model in the sense of, you know, like uh, ordering of memory accesses and stuff like that. Uh, we will get one. I'm waiting, waiting for it. Very relaxed. Okay, and uh, fortunately, when I submitted the port to GCC patches, I got a very good suggestion, which was like, hey, okay, you have to live with your storyboard limitations, but this is a virtual architecture. So you can lift them, you know, in order to, to test your compiler properly. And uh, so I am working on this at the moment. This, I call it XPPF, the name is not important, you know, but uh, it's basically, well, to lift restrictions is a variant of XPPF without most of the restrictions. So I can, for example, run the GCC uh, test suite without having to disable like 20% uh, of them, of the tests. Um, if I add a mode, you know, to so I can access the color frame pointer, uh, frame uh, a stack frame with the frame pointer, I can get, I can have uh, back traces, you know. So that means that for XBPF I can actually support DORF, which means I can use GDB, and so on. And, uh, and well, to lift the restrictions, you know, to make the compiler, the, you know, the development of the, of the backend better, but also to help the BPF users. This is coming. Um, the current status of the port is that the Vinutils and the, and the GCC ports are both upstream. Uh, by the way, I have to thank very much to, to Seger, to Jeff, and to Richard Sandifor, especially Richard, because of the reviews of the port. They were super helpful. And you know what was committed at the end? Uh, it was much better than what I originally posted. And this is not gratuitous as leaking. I mean, I mean, I mean it. I mean it. It was awesome. And uh, what are the next steps? Uh, well, to make the generated programs use, you know, useful in the kernel, you know, that they can run. Then to support new of the stuff, you know, which has been introduced uh, recently, like this compile once run everywhere. If you want details about this, you can address me later. Um, to support BTF, which is this uh, yet another um, type description debugging format. Uh, to support CTF2, of course. And, uh, well, to continue working uh, with the kernel community to make sure that the compiler, the toolchain we are providing to them, is actually useful for them. And I have to say, by the way, that uh, back in Plumbers, it was very interesting in this sense because all those options that, for example, I was adding, because I was considering, you know, that uh, they were super useful, well, it turns out, you know, that they are not as useful as I thought they were. Right? Why? Because I like the experience that they have in using, actually using that stuff. So I have to say that, uh, f at least for me, it was very useful. And uh, the two days I spent there, you know, actually helped already to make the, the port better. And uh, that's it. Questions? Hey, it's a great port. I've enjoyed watching all the discussions on IRC as it's been progressing. Um, I didn't quite get the point about the zero register. I mean, zero registers are not a feature of every ISA. No. And you have, a, uh, you have small constants available as an immediate in your instruction. Does that not suffice, zero being a pretty small constant? Not really, because the, the, the instruction sets that do not have uh, zero registers they compensate having appropriate addressing modes. Like for example, in BPF you only have 
a register plus immediate addressing. Meaning that uh, um, if you want, I mean, if you want uh, a zero base because you want to load from an immediate, access, an immediate, an absolute address, for example, then you need to load a zero to that register. And then to use, well, or loading a zero to the register or loading the address to the register and then, you know, doing a, a, a load to the register plus zero in the instruction. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, maybe I, I find it, you know, that I find the, like, the lack of it. I feel the lack of it. But maybe it's because I come from a Spark, you know, for where we use the zero register for everything, basically. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so it's more a question of efficiency than impossibility. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, well, there is one example. Sorry, it is... Uh, there are two load instructions in BPF which are not generic, which are called uh, those ones. LDABS and LDIND which basically, why do you have to have a load absolute and a load indirect? Why you cannot use the same instruction? Because of this, right? You have a load absolute, basically you can pass an immediate, and uh, to load indirect you, have to you can pass a register plus immediate. For efficiency, I, I guess. Yeah, of course, you can always do the second using two instructions, but yeah, using one is better. Quick one. I don't quite get uh, what the why it wasn't useful to have the option to target a particular kernel uh, version. So it's not. So the point. Their point was that uh, the B, the kernel version doesn't identify the version of BPF. That you'd still want to be able to target older versions of the BPF interface, regardless of what kernel version is backported to. So it's more like there's no easy way of doing that. But I don't see why it wouldn't be useful. Because otherwise, if I upgrade my compiler, do I also have to upgrade my kernel? That, that would be kind of nuts. That was exactly my reason, my original reasoning, yes. But I was convinced that uh, in practice, because they say no, because we use backports, you know, and uh, then uh, um, if you, because, Okay, this is about the author of the, pro the BPF program, right? It's like, okay, I want this program to run in kernel 4.7 or later, because it uses some helpers which were introduced in mainline 4.7. Uh, but then it can run, you know, in... Um, yeah, 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 I know, I mean, yeah. Uh, to me, it, it also sounds good, but apparently, uh, well, anyway, what I am going to do with that is I will leave the option there, and it defaults to latest. So then it's up to them, you know, to use it or not. Hmm. So what is uh, the ballpark complexity of the programs you expect people to compile to EPPF? Well, today, the verifier will let pass bounded loops, at least a subset of bounded loops, um, because until a few weeks ago, you needed to, uh, to unroll all the loops, because otherwise the verifier will not uh, allow them, allow your program, because you cannot have, have like backwards jumps. You could not have backwards jumps. Um, uh, also, the support for BPF to BPF function calls, like normal function calls from one to another, it was has been only supported only since a few months ago. So the the kernel verif the verifier is getting much much more smart, and that means that the sophistication of the BPF programs that you can run is getting bigger too. And also, I know that the kernel hackers are looking to, to, to lift, you know, many of the restrictions. Like, for example, until not that long ago, the, the BPF program was limited to a maximum of 4,000 instructions, more or less. Now, it, they bumped it to, I don't know, 1 million or something like that. 
but it goes slowly. But I expect that uh, because the thing is that now they are using BPF in many, many more kernel subsystems, including file systems, for example. And uh, they will need more sophistication in the programs, yes. Uh, so you told that uh, BPF uh, hardware uh, doesn't support uh, floating point operations, but uh, now if we have a GCC port of eBPF, can we reuse software float emulation? Well, I can tell you what I did. Um, basically, I did the backend in a way that the port in a way that uh, you can move floating point values around. So you can have a function with a double and return it and pass it and whatnot. And then um, it generates fun calls for operations, for adding addition, subtraction and whatnot. Now, of course, at the moment there is nothing implementing those. But nothing, well, I was going to say nothing prevents you to support it, to implement it. Well, yeah, probably a lot of things prevent you to implement it, but uh, you can try, yes. I tried to build a new lib. For BPF, no chance with the five limitation of five uh, arguments, no chance. And I actually started to tweak it, you know, the build, the make files and everything, but then at some point they were, okay, what are you doing? Stop. And, uh, but with XBPF, which is what they want to run in the simulator for testing the compiler, I will lift those limitations and I will, I will, I will make a new report, including maybe floating point support, why not? So if the complexity of BPF programs looks to increase in the future and um, the restrictions are going to be removed, the thing I'm wondering about is recursion. How far away are we from being able to put the kernel inside the kernel? Well. I'm not an expert on BPF, I'm just the compiler guy, you know, I mean, but uh, I am pretty sure that the verifier will never allow you to do real recursion in a BPF program, because I think that it, that's not even allowed in normal C code in the kernel. I mean, uh, no, you can have uh, tail, uh, you know, tail recursion, but um, not real recursion, no. I don't think that will be I, I I didn't mean like, the programming language feature recursion. I meant like put it, um, putting a kernel inside the kernel. Oh, you mean a Linux port in BPF? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> sure, but it, it will have to be next BPF. But yeah, sure. Yeah, why not? Why not? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you're looking into uh, Dwarf One uh, yes. debugging information. Yes. I uh, I don't think I don't think that support still exists in GCC anymore. It it's a dead end. That's what I was fearing. Yeah. Yeah. What? Hmm? Yeah. It's it's dead. And uh, so what can we do about it then? What was what was the problem with Dwarf Two? Well, the thing is that I cannot I I can't have a. a a frame address. I mean, you cannot refer to the previous frame using um, the current frame pointer, basically. So I can't see any way how can you backtrace. Yeah. Well, I guess we could pass the base, the previous frame pointer um, as an invisible argument, I guess. But then we are wasting one of the five registers for arguments. Yes. 
I tried to do that, but I could not get anything compiling then. Jose? Yeah. Over yes. Here. We're out of time. Ah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, by all means, carry on questioning, Jose, but um, uh, if you want tea, tea, afternoon tea and coffee, it's now available. Okay. That's Thank good. you, Jose. Thanks. Thank you.